I, I think I can speak for parents, for Sunday school teachers, community group leaders, elders, other pastors, certainly myself. There is no greater joy than to see a person come to Christ and then be hunger, hunger for the word and the fellowship, and they just grow conspicuously. They're just on fire for the Lord, and their passion just grows hotter and hotter and hotter for Jesus to the point where one day they become reproducers. They become disciple makers. There is no greater joy than to see that happen. On the flip side, there is no greater grief in ministry to see a person begin well in the faith and grow and have this passion for Jesus, only over a long period of time, all of a sudden, it comes to the point where you get a phone call or a Facebook message or an email that says, I'm done. I no longer believe the truths of Christianity. I no longer believe in Jesus. I no longer want to be part of a church. It's over. My faith is gone there is no greater grief in ministry than that to happen. I would say this, there is no greater grief for a parent to hear that from their child when they get that phone call that says, Mom, Dad, I know you want me to have faith in Jesus. I just don't. I don't believe in him. I don't believe in the claims of Christianity. I don't want to go to church. I want to live my own life. There is no greater grief than that for a parent to hear. I think Paul, the apostle, understands that. He understood what it was to pour his life into people only to see them go. There are a couple of places, for example, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, where he writes to Timothy and says, but avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have swerved from the truth. Hymenaeus and Philetus, we don't know anything about them except that this. They began and they were with Paul. They were in that church in Ephesus and they were part of the fellowship. And Paul says somewhere along the way, they didn't reject the gospel, they just swerved from it. And guess what happens when you swerve from something? The more you go, the greater the distance is that you were from original. And it grieves his heart. Stay away from people like that, Timothy. It had to grieve Paul to write those words. He does it again in chapter four. Timothy, do your best to come to me soon. Why? Because Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me. Demas, you are the one assigned to take care of Paul. When you're in prison, there's not this government program that gives you three square meals. You are at the mercy of whoever's on the outside to keep you alive. Demas, it was your job to care for Paul, but because you loved the world. It wasn't because you were afraid of persecution. You loved the world. He left. So Timothy, hurry up and get here. Hurry up and get here because Demas has left. I think the Apostle Paul understands the grief and the discouragement that can come from pouring your life into other people and always seeing them leave. I think Jesus knew that too. In John chapter 6, he is doing this incredible teaching about his own centrality how he himself is the bread of life. He's making this incredible claims about himself, not his teaching about him. But then John makes this observation in John 6, verse 66. After this, many of his disciples, many, not many of the multitude, many of his disciples, there were more than just the 12 that followed Jesus. Many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. What, what would motivate a person to follow Jesus and then all of a sudden not? What, what is that? 
Well, I, I think it's not because of circumstances. I think it's because of what I call spiritual death by a thousand different cuts. It's just where there's this veer, this swerve, this drift away. I, I don't know of anybody, and maybe there is, but I don't know of anybody that's ever come to me and says, I just woke up this morning and decided I'm not going to believe. But when you talk to someone who was white hot for Jesus and believing in Jesus and loving Jesus, and then all of a sudden it seems that they're not, you find out there is this steady drift. A drift that maybe they don't even detect. And that's why the book of Hebrews is so important to us. The writer of Hebrews is very, very concerned because believers who began in Christ are drifting. He makes this observation in chapter 2, verse 1. We'll look at it in more detail a little bit later on. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. This is the first commandment. This is the first charge in the book of Hebrews. And notice it's in chapter 2. So what is chapter 1? Because all of a sudden, this word therefore is saying, the writer of Hebrews is saying, based upon what I just wrote, Pay much closer attention to what you have heard. Well, let's find out. Get your Bibles open, would you please? And turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, and let's take a look at this. Because the command of chapter 2 is pay attention. And so that's what it is. I'm a church kid. I was told to pay attention a lot on the Sundays. Pay attention. My grandma Hardinger, I always sit next to her because she was nicer. And she'd always give me lifesavers. Or the, the uh, Luden's cherry cough drop. Do they even make those anymore? Oh, I, mean, I ate those like candy. And so I could, I could act like I was worshiping with the best of them as long as I had a Luden's cherry cough drop in my mouth. And so pay attention was something that happened a lot in my life growing up. But maybe it's God's call to you now is to pay attention. So the question is, pay attention to what? Well, the first thing is, pay attention. Let's go to to the point first of all, please. Pay attention. Christ is supreme. Christ is supreme. I want you to notice something here. I'm not saying pay attention to Jesus, pay attention to Christ, but rather pay attention to his supremacy. I think that many times is where we are caught, is that Jesus is a very popular figure nowadays. Very few people despise Jesus. They have high acclaim for Jesus, high praise for Jesus. But for us who believe in him, we do not just say we really, really like Jesus, give him a thumbs up every day, but rather we say Jesus Christ is supreme. There is no one above him and no one beside him. He is the one and only. He is supreme. The supremacy of Christ is a keynote doctrine of the Christian faith. It's not just Jesus, but the supremacy of Jesus and the writer of Hebrews, he, wants, he or she wants us to know that. He wants us to know that Christ is supreme. And so he takes all of chapter 1, and that's all they write about. It's a declaration on the supremacy of Christ. Check it out. Chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Now we'll look at some other passage here in a second, or a further passage, but notice a couple of lines in this because the writer of Hebrews is identifying who this son is. All right, these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. Well, who's his son? Whom he appointed the heir of all things. Jesus Christ owns everything. He has all authority over everything. And if that's not enough, he goes on and says this, through whom also he created the world. Jesus Christ is the creator. How many of us, how many of us think that Jesus wasn't created until the conception, until Christmas? That's when Jesus came on the scene. Wrong. He has always been. The sun has always been. Who do you think walked with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day? The son of God. The creator of the universe. 
But then the writer of Hebrews doesn't stop there. He goes on. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Let's look through this again, because he's making some statements about this son. He is the radiance of the glory of God. If you want a glimpse of the radiance of the glory of God, take a look at Jesus. Draw near to Jesus. He is the glory of God. You do not need glory dust. You don't need a glory cloud. Christ is the glory of God. But then he goes on. And the exact imprint of his nature. Remember in the Gospels, there are a couple of different times when Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen what? You've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. It's those kinds of statements that got him killed because he is the exact imprint. You and I are mere image bearers. Jesus is the image. He is the one. He goes on. Upholds the universe by the word of his power. This is the supremacy of Christ. This is, this is little baby Jesus, meek and mild, lying in a manger. And he upholds the entire universe. You see, in our experience, because of the earth's rotation, it looks as if the sun is rising and setting. And we can always bank on that happening at certain times of our day. And scientists can go through and say, well, it's because of the earth's rotation, the gravitational pull, the orbit, the trajectory of the earth's orbit. All the, there are all kinds of scientific reasons on why it looks that way. Who makes all that stuff happen, Jesus? The human body is so so intricate. Right then and there, right then and there, you just took a breath. Now, a, a biologist or a, a scientist could say, well, the reason why you took a breath is because your lungs are doing this, it brings oxygen in your bloodstream and, and it goes to your heart and keeps your heart pumping. That's great, it's wonderful. Who makes that happen? Jesus. Is what the writer is saying. This is, this is the one who was crucified on the cross. This is the supremacy of Jesus. And then he goes on. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. We tend to look at angels and we think, oh my goodness, an angel appeared. To the writer of Hebrews, Big stinking deal. Jesus is superior to the angels. Amen. In fact, the rest of chapter one in Hebrews is just showing that Jesus is indeed superior to all heavenly beings and all earthly beings. Jesus Christ is superior. And then he gets to chapter two, verse one, and says, therefore, therefore pay much closer attention. But throughout the book of Hebrews, I'm, I'm sorry, I got ahead of you. Go ahead and go back to chapter three. Also on the book of Jesus, the, the writer of Hebrews is so obsessed, so committed to making sure that we understand just exactly whom we pay attention to. He says this in chapter three. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. One of the most familiar passages to those of us who've been around the Bible for a while, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, looking to Jesus. So the command, the command of Hebrews is pay attention. And so the question I have for you is, are you? Is Jesus Christ supreme in your life? Does your schedule reveal that? Does your affection reveal that? Does your calendar reveal that? How you love your spouse, how you raise your children, in your singleness, is Christ supreme in your life? I don't ask those, quest those questions to pour the guilt upon you. I'm just asking you to ask that. I'm paying attention to something or someone. It, it, it's impossible to think of nothing. 
We are always paying attention to something or someone. And so if it is not the supremacy of Christ, who is it? That's the question that looms over us. Are you worried about the future? In your older years, are you concerned that you won't be taken care of? Are you, are you so obsessed with tomorrow that you cannot enjoy today? What is supreme in your life? Those are the kinds of questions that the writer of Hebrews wants us to respond to. So that's the who. The who is to pay attention to Christ, to not just the Christ, but to the supremacy of Christ, that he is supreme. Pay attention to that. Pay most careful attention, he says, to that. Well, why? Chapter two again. Pay attention because you can drift. Look at this. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it lest we drift away from it. That's why this little sermon series is called The Drift. It's because it is very, very possible for us as believers in Jesus Christ to experience this drift where all of a sudden, it seems all of a sudden, that we wake up and we are conspicuously disinterested in who Jesus is, who the people of God are with his word, It's not any one big decision, it's just a thousand mini ones. And we find ourselves, yeah, I could take him or leave him. The the body of Christ, I could take him or leave him. The Bible, I know enough not to believe half of it. And you walk away. This This is what hurts us. I've got a definition of drift, it's right here. A gradual shift in position. And the emphasis is on the word gradual a gradual shift in position, an aimless course to become carried along subject to no guidance or control. Picture yourself on the American River and you're on the shore and you're just watching the water go by and all of a sudden you see a twig just bobbing up and down and it just goes on by. It just floats on by. That's the drift. It's just a gradual shift in position, an aimless course to become carried along, subject to no guidance or control. Whatever is, what is guiding that little twig floating down the American River? Not the twig, the current. Wherever, wherever the river flows, that's where that twig is going to go. That's it. It is completely out of control, no effort whatsoever. It's just floating on by. So here's the question in chapter 2 of Hebrews. All right, okay, Craig, we've got to pay attention to the supremacy of Christ so that we don't drift. Well, what do we drift from? We drift away from this. It goes on in Hebrews chapter 2 and says this in verse 2. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? He's calling us to go back to the Old Testament. And the message of the Old Testament, the message of God's covenant with Abraham, the message to many of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was delivered by angels And God is saying, I delivered this message to them that they never saw with their own eyes. I was always forecasting, thinking ahead to Jesus. And I told Abraham, I told Moses, I told Isaac, I told Jacob, I told all of the early church fathers, I told them of this, this Savior that's coming. They never saw him, not once. But you, you have. And every promise I made In the Old Testament, I kept. For those who trusted me, I blessed. For those who disobeyed me, I judged. That has not changed. And so if you drift from the supremacy of Christ, if you do not pay close attention to the supremacy of Christ, then you will drift. And guess what happens if you drift? You will be ignoring the only source of salvation that you have. That's what he's saying here towards us. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? That's what happens to drifters. Is they just neglect it. They just pay attention to something else. They swerve, they veer to the point where eventually they reject. 
and there is no escape. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, I don't want that to happen to you. And the only remedy for that is to pay attention. That's it. I know it's a strange thing, but to pay attention. So really, you can summarize it this way. Here's the principle. The principle is this. If you want to avoid spiritual drifting, and I'm assuming that all of us in this room want to, even if you're not a Christian, nobody wants to drift. And so if you really want to avoid spiritual drifting, here is the antidote. Pay attention to Jesus and his gospel. Now, for those of us who have lived around the church, we're kind of going, I really wish it'd be something new. I really wish it'd be something I never knew before. This just isn't intellectually stimulating. Well, I don't think it was meant to be. The truth is still the same truth. If you want to avoid spiritual drifting, pay attention to Jesus and his gospel. The question then remains for you and for me, whom or what has your attention? We are all attention givers. Every one of us here are paying attention to something. And it doesn't have to be evil. It doesn't have to be sinful. It can be good. It can be acceptable. It can be your job. It can be finances. It could be your body. It could be relationship. It could be success. It could be failure. It could be money. It could be all kinds of things. To whom or what are you paying attention? That's the question that we have to ask And one of the first questions we ask ourselves in 2019, to whom are we paying attention? Now, in my opinion, and this is just just my opinion, there are three three different groups of people here today in this room. Three different groups of people. The first group is this. You have been drifting and you're back. And it may be that you've been away for a long time and today you are here because you recognize that you had drifted and, 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 and you want to live for Christ. And you recognize that and so you're back. And I want to say, welcome back. Better, welcome home. We're so glad that you're with us, but there are a couple of temptations that you will fight if you're not careful. It could be that you are back and you despise your sin so much that you are going to spend every ounce of your time fighting that sin and getting rid of that sin. And what often happens to us is we turn our back and we pay attention to our sin and we neglect the one who saved us from it. And that's not what the scripture says about how we fight sin. We fight sin by looking to Christ by focusing on the supremacy of Christ. Last Sunday, we had, I don't know, the sixth or seventh um, uh, Behold Sunday of the year. And almost every single Sunday, Behold Sunday, I will say this, you and I, we do not suffer from a sinning problem, we suffer from a beholding problem. Because when we behold the supremacy of Christ, when we behold how great he is, and how beautiful he is, and how wonderful, and how amazing he is, all of a sudden, the things of this earth grow strangely dim. So that can be a temptation for you. Another temptation for those of you who may be back, you've been drifting and you're back with us, is that you and I, we're all suckers for spiritual experiences. We want to feel the presence of Jesus constantly. And it could be that today you have experienced that. You are doing that. And so what happens for us is we are all creatures of habit. We're thinking, okay, Jesus has come upon me in such a miraculous and experiential way. I want to make sure and do the same thing next Sunday. So I'm going to sit right there. I'm going to sit right there. I'm going to sit right there. And I hope we sing the same songs. And I'm going to do the same things. I went to this retreat and God moved. And so I'm going to do that again and again and again and again. And all of a sudden what happens is we begin to pay attention to the things that brought us back and we turn away from the one who brought us back. So that can happen to those of us who are here and we recognize that we were drifting and we're back and we're loving it and we don't ever want to drift again. Well, let me just say this. If you never want to drift again, do not wait for your next spiritual experience. Pay attention to the supremacy of Christ constantly, regardless of your experience. Regardless of what you feel, pay attention to the one who saved you. 
And then, second group of people, you have been drifting and you're aware. It may be that today you are aware for the first time. Never heard a sermon on the drift before. You've never even read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. And all of a sudden, you are strangely convicted by the fact that you have been drifting all along. Well, the knee-jerk reaction for many of us, if we've experienced that, and I have as well, is guilt. Oh, man, I, I have not loved my wife the way I should. I have not raised my children the way I should. I have, I have so many regrets in my life. I've done so many things wrong and just poured over with all kinds of guilt. <coughs> I'll tell you this. Guilt is a revealer. It reveals either arrogance or humility. Guilt will reveal arrogance if we say, I feel so bad that I've done this. I feel, I feel so bad that I haven't loved Debbie the way I should. I feel so bad that I haven't been the pastor that I should for Arcade Church. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. That just reveals my arrogance. But arrogance either reveals, or uh, guilt either reveals arrogance or it reveals humility. If you regret how you've lived your life. It doesn't do any good for you to beat yourself over the head and say you're going to turn over a new leaf today. That's the arrogant part of you. What needs to happen is that that guilt overwhelms you to the point where you run to the one who freed you from it, Christ. He has taken the guilt that you bear upon himself and he bore it for you forever. And so if that guilt that you're experiencing because you have been drifting, if it does not take you to the cross, it's going to take you away from it. And so go to the cross and confess that and know that it's been paid for there and you are free of that. But it could be that today you have been drifting and you are aware. So guess what? The writer of Hebrews says, well, I think you better pay close attention to Jesus, to the supremacy of Jesus, to your creator, to your savior, to your friend, to the forgiver of your soul and your sins. Pay attention to him. And then third, you have been drifting and you're clueless. You have no idea that you're drifting. It could be that you're a church kid and you've been pulling church time your whole life and you're in church, so it must be Sunday. And you're here, but, but your life is characterized by one drift after another. You are like that twig on the American River. You just want to go with very little effort wherever the current takes you. And that's the problem with drifting is it takes zero effort and zero thought. You don't have to do a thing to drift. But here's the problem. No one, no one ever drifted into obedience to Christ. No one ever drifted into holiness. No one ever drifted into a relationship with him. When you are drifting on that river, what direction do all rivers go? Downhill. And they grow further, and that twig, it goes further and further and further and further away from where it began. And so maybe this morning, you need to pay attention. Not to me, not to the next song, but you need to pay attention to the supremacy of Christ. It has been so long since he has been your treasure, and maybe he never was. You just prayed the prayer in a Sunday school class because the teacher encouraged you to do that. You didn't mean a lick of it. You want nothing to do with this, then you will not escape. You will never escape. But Jesus Christ being the supreme, that there is no one ahead of him and no one beside him. There is no place for you to turn, no place else for you, except in the arms of Christ, the one who saves us 
the one who is amazing in his gift of salvation, the one who bore your guilt and mine, the one who bore your sins and mine on the cross and paid for them all forever. There is no other salvation for you. There is no other offer. So the worst thing that you could possibly do is to continue floating by. So how do you know if you're drifting? Well, let me give you a couple of ways to know. You know you're drifting when your passion for Jesus is in the past tense. You remember a time when, man, you and Jesus were walking arm in arm. You remember a time when you couldn't get enough of the fellowship of the saints and you couldn't get enough of Jesus himself and you couldn't get enough of the Bible. You remember those times and, and oh yeah, I, I forgot about that. I forgot that, man, I was really on fire for the Lord. I'm not anymore, but I'm here. I'm here doing, doing what Christians do, but, but as far as that, that heat that burned for Jesus, it's just not there anymore. You've drifted. You're drifting. You know you're drifting when you justify that sin. Yeah, I, I come to church and I serve and I give and I'm involved, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign up for a community group, but, and I know I've got that one sin, but it's just, it's just mine, it doesn't hurt anybody, it's just mine, and I've, besides, I'm doing all these really great things, you're drifting. If you think that that one little sin will not do harm to you or to others, you're drifting. Pay attention to Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. You know you're drifting, when Christian community is a chore. It's just, oh, I gotta hang around. Okay, I can do that for an hour and 15 minutes every Sunday. I can hang out with Christians, but my real people, the people I really, really love, the people that I rely on, aren't any of you. You're drifting. You know you're drifting when the first time you opened your Bible this week, was about 35 minutes ago. You're drifting. I, 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 don't, I don't have you respond to these questions or these statements to pour guilt upon you unless that guilt drives you to the cross of Christ. Then by all means, feel guilty. But if that guilt just pours over you and it feels like a ton of bricks pour over you and you're gonna walk out of here carrying those bricks, you're drifting. You've missed the point. If Jesus Christ is supreme, then he is supreme over your guilt and he will take your guilt. And so if all you get out of this today is guilt, could that be that you're still drifting? Because the last thing that Jesus wants from you is to drift. He wants you to enjoy him. He wants you to, to bask in his glory and to be loved by him, to enjoy the forgiveness and the mercy that he has for you. He wants you to live in that. And if, the, if that sounds like it's just too good to be true, could that not be evidence that you're drifting? Maybe today is the day if you've been floating on the river of life and going wherever the cultural current takes you, is that you just simply stand up in the middle of the current. That will take effort. And you say, I, I'm no longer going to drift. Jesus Christ is my savior. He is my master. I professed that long ago and I have drifted from that. I will drift no more. He is supreme. He is Lord of my life. Fathers, is it possible that because you have drifted, your household has drifted as well? I do not say that to pour the guilt upon you. I say that so that you declare that Jesus Christ in your life is supreme and in your home he will reign as well. If all you can do is look back with woulda, coulda, shoulda, I didn't do this and should have done that, 
then you're missing the point. Stand up in the cultural stream and face the current and pay much closer attention to Jesus Christ who is supreme over all things. Embrace him, draw near to him. And it could be that you're not a Christian at all. You didn't even know there was such a thing as drifting. But that's what, what brought you here today. What brought you here today may be the curiosity of the moment when the Spirit of Christ begins to speak to you, begins to whisper in your ear, the claims that are being spoken are true. Believe them, place your faith in them, trust them. Drift no more. Maybe you gotta do something, and so in a couple of minutes, we're gonna sing a song, Be Thou My Vision, and I want you to, to just wallow, bask, bathe in the lyrics of that song and make them a de declaration for your own life. And if you need to move, if you need to act, then by all means, come forward. Dads, fathers, husbands, wives, moms, parents, just come forward and say, today we are standing up in the current of our culture and we are going to pay much closer attention to the supremacy of Christ, to his beauty, to his sacrifice, to his blood, to his teaching, to his power, to his actions. Christ and nothing else is supreme in my life. I declare that now today. And maybe that's what needs to happen for you, for me. Let's stand together. Thanks for listening to the Arcade Church podcast. Visit us at arcadechurchonline.com, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram.